North Star, how's it going? Pretty well for me. How about you, Dory? I can't complain, but I have been getting a lot more questions from explorers. How about you? I have too. I think it'd be really interesting to look into some of those questions. All right, well then let's dive into it. One of the questions that I've heard about kind of keys into something that I'm really interested in. I look outside and I'm seeing the bright sun and the blue sky. Any minute now, we're gonna have some nice hot temperatures. And I know that you are gonna agree with me on this one because you like to swim. I cannot wait to get out to the beach or over into the ponds and the lakes. And, um, and even to, in order to get away from the crowds now, we have to think about social distancing, maybe even indulging in our, our own backyard swimming pools or better yet, a friend that has a swimming pool. But one of the things that's always bothered me about that is, is why people add chlorine to their pools. You know, that's a really great question. In fact, I remember having the same thing, having the same question myself when I was a kid. Hmm. It turns out the biggest reason we use it now is to prevent the spread of disease in water by killing viruses and bacteria. So like just before the 20th century, people started worrying about getting sick from being in lakes or swimming in pools or swimming in ponds. Um, so some of them would actually even take their swimming pools that they built and build them kind of on an angle, try to drain them out and refill them. But those techniques didn't really prevent anything. Like an so, uphill, downhill thing. Exactly. So that they could just say, okay, well, it's on this angle, it's going to drain out, and then we'll just add more water, and the fresh water would be fine. Yep. Turns out that that unfortunately didn't cause, um, get us to the solution we were looking for. So around 1911, Brown University actually decided that they were going to try something different. They added some bleach to their pool. After they did, the amount of bacteria changed drastically. It went from 700 parts per million to zero in 15 minutes. They add, so they added bleach in way back in that experiment in 1911, but that's that's what chlorine is? Chlorine is the same as like the bleach we use in laundry? Well, it kind of can be. When we say chlorine, we're usually meaning hypochlorous acid or the hypochlorite ion. We usually get that from bleach solutions or powders that contain things like sodium hypochlorite or calcium hypochlorite. Um, instead of the chlorine gas itself. I mean, you could technically bubble that through things, but that would not necessarily be as safe. Yeah. So these chemicals, they actually destroy the phospholipids in cell membranes so effectively that it kills most microorganisms in a very short amount of time. Goodbye, yeah. algae and bacteria. I recognize that name lipid, that word lipid, because of all we've read about the, uh, the current coronavirus. And that's that like little fatty layer that you can break that up and kill a virus. Exactly. As good. soon as that breaks, then whatever's inside is susceptible to be destroyed really quickly. But if it if it if it can kill those germs and kill that bacteria, um, is that why our eyes you know, like turn all red and get uh, and, and and sting? You know, when we go swimming in a pool. You know, it turns out the chlorine compounds we add to the pools actually don't cause the burning to our eyes. In fact, if your eyes are burning, chances are you're going to actually, or the smell of the chlorine is really strong. Chances are you actually need to add more to your pool. It turns out that these chlorine compounds actually interact with whatever else comes into the pool, whether it's your sweat or shampoo, or even if somebody has a little accident in the pool, everything from the swimmer's bodies can react with that stuff. And a lot of the time they create these things called chloramides. And these are the chemicals that actually cause the stinging sensation. And once they become chloramides, they can actually come out of the water and that chlorine smells where you can get it from. That's the balance can shift really quickly, though, depending on how much sunlight it gets and how much use the pool gets. So, it's so it all sounds about like, it sounds like there's a real important like a balance that you really have to kind of keep on it. Um, I mean, I've watched I've watched guys at like the you know the swimming pools, you know, clubs, and stuff like that, and they're always doing the little test tube things with colors. Absolutely, you got to yeah. test it all the time. The experts actually recommend you test it at least once a day, and they've got to look for a variety of things from the chlorine to the pH to the bromine. Do they need to add more acid? Do they need to add more alkalinity? And yeah. once they get it to the right balance and, and can maintain it, then people are more likely to stay safe and healthy. So that that's just another example of chemistry in everyday life. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Dory. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's good. You're welcome. questions you've gotten from some of your explorers well you know I, I got an interesting one it, it kind of involves a little bit of a coincidence one of our young explorers uh, sent in uh, he had uh, taken a uh, he had had a tree taken down near his house and he noticed 
those tree rings or those growth rings that we sometimes see in the wood. And the funny thing was that I actually had the same thing. Uh, we hired a guy to cut down a tree in our yard last year. Um, so I had a really good opportunity to kind of answer this. And uh, I'm going to ask our, uh, our tech guru, uh, Skywalker, is going to help me out here and pop up a few pictures. Um, and the first one I'm hoping that he's going to show us kind of shows the stump that's left in the ground. And I put a meter stick across it just to show how big, how thick this tree was when it came down. And it, it comes pretty close to a whole meter. Wow. Right? Absolutely. This was a big old tree. And I knew, I knew it was going to be old. Um, so the next thing I did uh, in order to help out uh, to answer this question is I took a close up of one of the sections, one of the logs that came off of that stump. And you can see the alternating light and dark lines in there. Can you see those on your end too? Well, what do those light and dark lines mean? Well, it's really interesting. Trees grow a little bit each year. And it turns out that in the early spring and summer, trees grow fast and they and they they form around the outside edge just underneath the bark large cells and they're building uh, the ability to be able to bring water up from the ground and send sap back down to feed the rest of the tree so in the early part of the year the bands those little lines in there are really wide but as you get towards the end of the summer and approaching fall the tree knows so to speak that the growing season is coming to an end and they slow down their growth and the cells become a lot smaller. They're getting ready to kind of conserve their energy and it makes little tiny narrow bands. So it's not actually winter versus summer. It all takes place during the spring through early fall, but they creates this annual alternation between fast growth and wide bands and skinny growth and little narrow bands. So what I decided to do, our next picture is to show the core, that little that little sort of uh, bullseye target right at the middle of the tree, that's way, way back when the tree was just a little sapling. And I decided that I was going to try to count every 10 rings. So I would go narrow, wide, narrow, wide, narrow, wide. And I would stick a pin in the tree for every 10 years, right? And so you can see the pins pretty well with a little bit of shadow. and, and uh, Every now and then those little bands would be hard to follow and I'd have to kind of scoot sideways to find you know, a clear way to measure forward. And then finally, that nice long picture there, you can see a whole parade of pins and each position of those pins stands for 10 years. And if you watch, look carefully, just outside that little sapling, that very first pin, I decided that represented maybe roughly 10 years old. So the next pin, going on to the second pin, there's 20. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. At the edge of the picture, you can see 100 years. And believe it or not, just outside the picture, I kind of missed it there, is one last pin way out at the edge of the tree inside the bark that stands for 110 years. That was one old tree. Wow. 110 years old. So a little arithmetic. That tree started to grow somewhere back around 1910, right? way back even before World War One. And then one of the other things that I thought was interesting, my last two pictures, we'll put them up there side by side, is how the tree grew very unevenly on each side. And that first picture, if you look really closely just outside the bark at the bottom, you can see that measuring from the center of the tree out to the edge is only about 30 centimeters. But on the next, on the north side of the tree, for some reason, measuring from the center all the way out, it's 52 centimeters. So the tree kind of like grew way fat on one side and sort of skinny on the other side. Yeah, Why any I idea? Did that? Yeah, this is really interesting. Now, according to the to the research that I did, it turns out that trees can actually respond to their environmental conditions. And trees will sometimes grow a little bit fatter and a little bit broader in order to resist wind. So if the tree is growing in a place where it has persistent year round, constant, always the wind pushing on it, it will strengthen itself on the other side. And then the other thing they do is sometimes a tree will grow to try to get to the sunlight. And if the tree starts to lean, we've all seen those, right? In the woods, mm -hmm. the trees, they'll do the same thing. It, it senses that sort of compression and it will beef up 
that side of the tree in order to help hold itself up. Which I thought was absolutely fascinating. That's pretty cool. I always thought the trees always grew pretty uniformly around the middle, but now I learned something new. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. And there's a lot of things that, that scientists can figure out. They can look at some of the environmental conditions when trees were growing really well. And they can look at times where the tree might have been affected by a, like a cold season or cold year when it was unusually cold or maybe insects and things of that nature. And they can actually learn a little bit about past climatology by examining those, those tree rings and players, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, I think so too. Thanks again for sharing. Absolutely. Well, Dory, thanks for your time today. This was fun getting together. I know we, you know, we're doing this uh, uh, electronically and digitally and at a distance, and uh, it's nice to stay in touch. And with you there on that North Star. Thanks a lot for your help with those questions. And if you have a question out there, make sure that you send it to Ask Starbase. Absolutely. We'll see you guys again soon. We hope. Mm -hmm. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye.